I am a research scientist. Um, I study ocean circulation and change. Uh, and what I'm really interested in is basically ocean heat and volume transport. I was born and raised in Mexico. And uh, basically, uh, when I was about 18, I decided to go study in Canada. And my degree is in um, applied mathematics. So I, I mean, I didn't even realize that oceanography was a career until quite uh, later in life. And uh, I was interested, after I'd finished my degree in mathematics, to apply that to you know, a bigger question to do with the environment. I was always ultimately interested in climate change and how this was, um, this was impacting our society. But I was coming at it from a very technical point with a math background, so it was, it was a natural, it seemed like a natural transition to, to apply math to some environmental question. And that's how I got into, um, learned that there existed programs, PhD programs that did this sort of thing. So that's basically how I got into oceanography. And I completed my PhD in marine science in, uh, in the US. And once I was done that, um, I started doing a postdoc uh, over here in the UK at the National Oceanography Center on uh, monsoon dynamics in the Indian Ocean. Uh, the NOC is a great place to work. I mean, it's, it's one of the top institutes in the world for oceanography. But more than that, it's a place that has a really fantastic community of, of sciences and team. Uh, and this is not a trivial thing. It has resources to achieve and answer the questions that you want to pose. This is the institute where you can bring your ideas and then, you know, kind of find a team to make that reality with all the resources that, that, that come with that, such as field work or, you know, the robotics that you might need to monitor those changes or the models that can process those changes. So to have an institute that brings all of those elements together in terms of the observational, the modeling, uh, the community of experts, you know, that's really unique and really special about the NOC. Some people, you know, go to sea and basically never want to do it again in their lives. But then there's other of us that go to sea. And I can't describe it. It's like, it's like a life-affirming activity. I, you know, you're out in the middle of the ocean, in the middle of nowhere, and there's no other feeling like it. There's no other feeling like, um, knowing that the purpose of what you're doing and the science that you're trying to answer is, you know, happening right under your feet, you know, in the ship. But to answer your question about a typical day is, uh, so for example, on cruises where I've deployed an Argo float, and most of the cruises that I've done have typically been hydrographic cruises. What this means is that basically we go out and we do a line of the ocean, either zonally or mergionally, and we drop a CTD, which is basically a big package that has 24 bottles around it that captures water at different ocean depths. And at each ocean depth, we measure different properties. And we do this all along the line. So you can have upwards of 100 CTD sections. And you string them together. And that tells you something about the changes along that line. And we do this every five years so we can get long-term changes of what's happening with the circulation. In addition to this, we also deploy Argo floats. And kind of the way that works is, you know, the typically would go onto the aft deck. I would run a couple of tests on the Argo float to make sure that it was, it was working and primarily that it was communicating. Because if I gently deploy the Argo float in the water, even if everything's working, if it's not talking to the satellites, then we just threw, you know, 20 plus grand in the water that we're not, <laughs> we're not going to get back. So, you know, the first thing is to make sure that the systems are working and that is communicating the data to the satellite. And once that's done, um, Argo floats are one of the most, probably one of the most straightforward autonomous vehicles to deploy. Uh, depending on whether it's a standard float, you can just kind of lower in the water with a rope. Or the deep Argos, which are much bigger, much heavier, um, are gently winched over the side. So I, I think I've seen, again, completely based on my personal experience, which it, it, again is a, a drop in the bucket. Um, so I think that equality, and gender equality, I won't say diversity. I definitely don't see other types of diversity that isn't 
Um, I don't see much different. You might have to edit this out. What I'm not seeing is, uh, is a lot of racial diversity. I don't think that's improved at all. I think there's a lot of work to be done on that. In terms of gender diversity, I do think that we're getting a lot better. And I've definitely seen here, uh, you know, we have, we have role models here, which is not, which is not a small thing. It's a, it's a really positive thing. And here more and more, especially in the field, um, I think we have seen an improvement in gender diversity and uh, more and more women in leadership positions. Because it's not enough to just recruit um, women and other marginalized groups into a field. You have to, you have to um, uh, provide a platform, or you have to see that in terms of progression. And it has to come through in terms of leadership. Otherwise, that massive investment in talent is just lost.